Welcome everyone. My name is Julia Newman, Director of Leadership Giving here at the museum, and I am so excited to present tonight's program inspired by our current exhibition, Flags and Founding Documents, 1776 to Today. Uh, this exhibit is open through Labor Day, so if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, there's still time to plan a visit to Philadelphia. I'd like to introduce Matthew Skick, Curator of Exhibitions, who is joining us live from the museum, uh, and we'll welcome our special guest, Matt. Well, th thank you, Julia. I'm excited to be here uh, live from the museum inside Flags and Founding Documents. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Curator of Exhibitions here at the Museum of the American Revolution. I've been on staff here since uh, 2016. And uh, I served as one of the leaders of the project to uh, put together flags and founding documents 1776 to today. It's a, an exhibit that uh, brings together historic flags and historic documents on loan from private collections uh, and uh, tells the story of a changing and growing American nation. And tonight I'll be joined by uh, Dr. James F. Erdlicka from Arizona State University. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to have uh, uh, Jim uh, join me, and uh, I'd like to have uh, Jim uh, uh, say a little word, a few words about uh, himself and about uh, his career and how he um, became a really a, a young constitutional history scholar. So, Jim, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, pleasure to be uh, with you and all of you out there. Uh, like Matt said, I'm Jim Merdlicka. I'm uh, currently a lecturer at Arizona State University. Uh, by training, I'm an historian of uh, your guys' favorite subject, the American Revolution. So I'm especially thrilled to be um, doing this with you guys. Um, uh, again, trained as an historian of the um, American Revolution. Uh, I uh, received my PhD from the University of Virginia, and that's that uh, huge diploma behind me. Uh, uh, it's it's inordinately large. I don't know why they make them that large. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my history is, uh, again, I'm interested in these subjects. Um, I'm working on a book about uh, revolutionary constitution making, specifically uh, about uh, the state of Massachusetts. But um, I was thrilled to be able to work on this project that allowed me to range much more widely. And uh, that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. So tonight's program, we'll, uh, we'll talk, Jim and I are gonna engage in conversation about the uh, historic documents that we have on display uh, in this uh, exhibition. And uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, a kind of wide ranging uh, subjects. And if you have uh, questions, we're gonna save those to the end, but as we're going through and, and discussing these uh, constitutions and, and different stories behind them, please put your uh, questions in the chat uh, 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 option at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll uh, select some of those questions at the end and, and uh, enga engage in some conversations surrounding them. So the chat function is the place to do that. And I'd like to begin with a, a bit of an overview about the uh, exhibit and how it came to be. Uh, and so uh, the uh, Flags and Founding Documents exhibit opened uh, Flag Day weekend uh, uh, here uh, at the museum. And the uh, exhibit brings together, as I said, uh, over uh, 40 uh, historic flags on loan from uh, the collection of Jeff Bridgman, who is a, one of the leading collectors of antique uh, and historic American flags. The um, exhibit also uh, features flags on loan from other uh, private collectors. And the um, uh, exhibit uh, pairs that, those flags with uh, a really amazing document collection focusing on uh, state constitutions uh, from the uh, collection of the Dorothy Tapper Goldman Foundation. And Jim will, will uh, talk about that, the Dorothy Tapper Goldman Foundation uh, in a bit. Um, the exhibit itself uh, is in our special exhibits gallery, uh, Patriots Gallery on the first floor of the museum. And that's where I'm um, sitting uh, right now. Uh, the exhibit was sponsored by um, a, a number of different supporters of the museum. The presenting sponsor is American Heritage uh, Credit Union located here in Philadelphia. This exhibit was also uh, sponsored through a chairman's grant of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Democracy Demands Wisdom. Uh, also uh, sponsors include Morris Offit and Mark Shankman. 
And I'd also like to point out that this uh, exhibition was officially recognized by America 250, who the Museum of the American Revolution has partnered with uh, in our planning for the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence coming up just five years from now in 2026. Uh, the uh, exhibit has brought uh, you know, thousands of visitors already uh, in, its, in its doors, but the origins of this exhibit go back to uh, 20, to, uh, uh, even before 2020, but to an exhibit that was held at the New York Historical Society. And uh, Jim, I'd like to uh, have you uh, talk about that and your involvement with that project. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks. Uh, and I should note at the start, uh, I am from Ohio, so that's relevant. Uh, uh, so I'm really fascinated to see where everybody's coming from as well. So I was actually living right there in Philadelphia um, a few years back. I was um, a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was at that time that I was apprised of a pretty fantastic opportunity. I couldn't believe my luck, really. Um, that is that a collector and philanthropist, uh, Dorothy Dapper Goldman, who is based in New York, uh, was looking to put on an exhibit of her fantastic collection of uh, documents of Americana. Um, she had acquired uh, a huge and again, a, a remarkable collection of documents related to American constitutionalism over the years. Um, this, was, this built on um, things uh, acquired first by her late husband, uh, and this was um, a document that we'll certainly talk about, uh, the uh, printing of the U.S. Constitution, a very rare Dunlop and Claypool um, printing of the Constitution. But over time, Dorothy had built up this wonderful collection of not just documents related to the federal constitution, but also state constitutions. And so she was, because she had all this cool stuff, she wanted to let as many people as possible see it. And so I was there in Philadelphia working on constitutional things. And since that's not a very far trip, um, I was invited to go up and look, what she, look at what she had and see if there was a possibility that we could put on some kind of exhibit that would sort of, uh, sort of accentuate the rich stuff that she had. Uh, and uh, it was obvious that that was the case. Um, so we worked, we began working and planning it out uh, working with the New York Historical Society. It takes quite a while to do these things. And uh, certainly I wasn't alone. I'd like to emphasize that a huge uh, number of people, both at the New York Historical Society and uh, in, in sort of Dorothy's team uh, was uh, pivotal in helping me do all that. So definitely want to uh, uh, note that. And so uh, we worked on uh, putting the exhibit together and everything was in place for February, the grand opening in February of 2020, which we held. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Unfortunately, um, the New York Historical Society and everything else pretty much ended up closing down just a short time after that. So uh, we were thrilled that we were able to put that together and it lives uh, forever online in uh, the virtual exhibit that uh, you showed a, a snapshot of. And uh, I hope people, uh, if, if they're not able to visit the exhibit in Philadelphia, uh, go online, uh, colonistcitizensconstitutions.org, and they can go around uh, the virtual exhibit, the gallery that was in, in New York. So the exhibit um, ran <laughs> ultimately for over a year. That was a kind of unprecedented run, uh, not unfortunately for the reasons we would have hoped. Uh, and so some people got to see it, not as many as we would have liked, of course. So. We're thrilled that uh, we were able to move it down to Philadelphia, uh, where uh, you, uh, Matt, and everybody there at the museum uh, brilliantly combined the exhibit with this wonderful display of flags, which both visually and thematically, I think, complement uh, our story uh, extremely well. Um, I guess I'll, I'll say a few things about what I think uh, we were trying to do with the exhibit and why I think it's exciting and, and unique. Um, the first thing is, is something I did mention is the exhibit tries to present not just uh, documents related to the federal United States Constitution, really important, obviously, uh, but also the state constitutions. And seeing both of these things together, I think, gives a far uh, more complete understanding of this thing uh, we 
call American democracy. So certainly we'll, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. So that's the first point I'd make, the federal and state constitutions together. Um, deriving from that is um, the chronological scope of the exhibit, the sort of time frame that the exhibit tries to cover, um, not comprehensively, of course, but in some way we range from uh, really the colonial period, first document, the Georgia Charter, um, all the way through the early 20th century. And even that end date is a bit arbitrary. It really um, uh, uh, reflects the fact that uh, Dorothy's wonderful collection sort of tapers out uh, in the early 20th century. But the whole point of the exhibit in some ways is that this experiment in constitutional democracy is not limited to one moment, but it's ongoing. And the whole point of it is that it's never going to stop. So uh, by, by having that sort of long time frame, I think we kind of make an important point there. Um, alongside that is, is geographical. Um, the geographical scope of the exhibit uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, it spans all corners of the United States, ultimately. Philadelphia, where you are, Matt, really cool. Live there myself, very important. We'll talk about it. Uh, but it's not the only place that constitution making was going on. Uh, and in small towns and places all over the country, this was going on. So I think the exhibit tries to make that point. Um, and finally, uh, again, all of this is related, is uh, it tries to make the point that uh, constitution making isn't something done by just a small handful of people. You know, what happened just a couple of blocks away from where you are, Matt, um, the Constitutional Convention in 1787, again, really cool. Uh, very important, <laughs> we'll talk about it. Uh, but, you know, too, I think often we can kind of get sucked into thinking, well, that was the only sort of really important sort of constitutional discussion that ever took place in United States history. And in fact, what the exhibit shows is um, huge numbers of Americans that have engaged in this collective activity throughout the country's history. Uh, it's not just again, a handful of people, but um, a cast of thousands, millions, ultimately. So, um, and, and their handiwork is kind of on display in the exhibit. So that's a kind of serves as kind of a big framework maybe for all the stuff we're going to talk about uh, today. And that's kind of what we were trying to do. Well, thank you, Jim. And, and let's get right, right into it. And we're going to rewind uh, a bit. We're going to go back to uh, 1776, and we're going to uh, right. go ahead and, um, and, and look at the Constitution of Pennsylvania uh, from, oh, yeah. from 1776. So um, sure. to some of the questions I want to keep in mind as we're having this discussion is uh, when the American revolutionaries began writing constitutions, what kind of questions did they have to wrestle with and, and decide? What kind of governments did they indeed create? And what was revolutionary about what they did? Um, and so uh, with Pennsylvania as our, our first example, we're going to uh, look into uh, some, of the, some of the details of, of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And so the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 on, on display um, is a, a printed version of, of, the, uh, of the Constitution that was written uh, in that very uh, momentous year. Uh, in, follow, you know, following on the heels of the uh, Declaration of Independence, um, in, in which the uh, United States declares itself uh, to be an independent nation. But uh, then each of the states, uh, and some of the states had already been engaging in this, they're uh, creating their own uh, governments. Some are, are uh, ad uh, adapting their colonial charters um, and, and using it for the purposes of, of governing this, their new, newly declared states. Uh, but others are, are uh, kind of starting from scratch and rewriting or, or writing um, a, a, a new form of government for, for their state. And that's what, what happens in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, legislature of Pennsylvania gets together and, and decides that they're going to, to write a constitution, creating a Republican form of government. Uh, and uh, they come up with one of the more revolutionary constitutions. And, and Jim, maybe you can elaborate on, on that and reasons why. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Pennsylvania, certainly one of the more fascinating, most fascinating cases of this, you know, like you said, 1776, a lot going on already. You think, you know, Americans must have been thinking, hey, we just declared independence. We wrote a declaration. We uh, approved it. Uh, you know, it's all the Declaration of Independence itself was sent out uh, in places like my favorite state, Massachusetts, uh, where people voted on that. Should we declare independence? Yes. So they had a lot on their mind. They were fighting the British. <laughs> the war had, you know, obviously had started, was in full swing. You think they had enough on their plates. But the problem was, well, uh, so you've declared independence. Uh, what next? <laughs> that means if you declared independence, that means that. Um, whatever form of government that you had before, uh, in most cases, you're going to have to replace because isn't that the whole point of declaring independence? So the question then became, well, how do you do that? Um, what, uh, what is a constitution? And I think that's um, in, in getting at what's revolutionary about this moment and what Americans are doing. I think we have to remind ourselves of what a constitution is. I mean, the notion is that um, it refers to the kind of overall structure of the government, the sort of a fundamental set of laws, a, rule, a set of rules that governs the political system. And that notion that of a constitution isn't necessarily new. Uh, these colonists very much, uh, at least uh, a large number of them, very much enmeshed in sort of English uh, the English legal tradition, and would have thought that Great Britain itself had a constitution. Now, you might think, well, I've never read this British constitution, and that's the, that's the sort of key. You can't read it in any one place. Uh, the British constitution, as it had evolved over a very long time, was a kind of combination of understandings of some texts, like the Magna Carta, Bill of Rights of 1689, various other sort of, uh, sort of seminal um, developments uh, had all sort of congealed to create a sense that there was a fundamental system of government. Uh, there were certain things that were just sort of off limits. The uh, uh, Great Britain itself, and this is one of the great ironies um, in the years immediately preceding the American Revolution, is colonists would have looked to Great Britain and see not a despotism, but um, they were they thought of it as an empire of liberty, that Great Britain is the greatest force for freedom in the world. And a large part of that is because Great Britain had a constitution, a set of limits on power. The king couldn't do anything he wanted. Um, and, and so there was a, a understanding that uh, any political society had some kind of set of fundamental rules. The trick is, if you're a British colony that had just declared its independence, you don't have hundreds of years <laughs> to sort of gain some sort of general understanding of what the system should be. Often that's really bloody. There's lots of civil wars in English history. Um, you don't wanna go through that. So the, the trick is coming up with a way to decide all of these things relatively quickly. And one way to do that is instead of having this sort of um, hazy notion of a constitution, let's write it all down <laughs> in one place. Uh, it's gonna be tricky because you're not gonna think of everything at once, but you can do a pretty good job of laying out the basic structure. And as you said, Matt, uh, a lot of these colonies are building on earlier documents, charters and other colonial documents that kind of give a framework for the government. And so, uh, in Pennsylvania's case, they have some of these things. Pennsylvania, pretty messy in the colonial period right before independence. So uh, the, um, the, the task of creating a government, this first constitution for Pennsylvania is gonna be uh, going to lead to a very interesting document. Indeed, that is what, uh, what they do. Um, the, the Pennsylvania constitution is notable for a in a few ways. One, it's, there's, no, um, there's no governor uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a president actually of Pennsylvania, but uh, he's a kind of uh, head of the a council, 
an executive council that uh, isn't an, isn't a second house of of, uh, of of the assembly. There's kind of a unicameral legislature. That is, you know, think of Congress today. There's House. There's the Senate. Both need to pass laws. Pennsylvania, nope, just one assembly that needs to pass laws. And in fact, and this is one thing we highlight in the exhibit, is Pennsylvanians have a sense that they really want to get government closer to the people. And they think, you know, people should continue to exercise a, you know, ordinary people, not just the representatives in the assembly, should continue to exercise a voice in the laws that are passed. And so, one thing they do in their constitution, section 15, is say, um, we're going to print all the proposed laws um, before final amendment. We're gonna send them out for the people and everybody's gonna be able to read them. And those laws won't go into effect until the next session of the legislature. Well, in the intervening period, there's gonna be another election. And so everybody's gonna be debating, the idea at least, is that they're gonna be debating all these laws. They're gonna uh, you know, uh, presumably vote for candidates. Uh, to represent them, and those people, the, that, those next set of that next set of representatives are going to be the ones that are going to pass the laws. So um, there's going to be a kind of opportunity for people to continue to exert their voice in the political system. It's very novel. Uh, there's a lot of critiques of this form of government from uh, both people within Massachusetts and people without. Ultimately, they have to they rewrite the Constitution in 1790, but in this moment, 1776, this seems to embody something um, really uh, powerful about the potential of the American Revolution. What might the American Revolution mean in practical terms, in terms of the, the governments that Americans are going to establish? Pennsylvania sort of scopes out one end of the spectrum. And, and one of the things I want to point out about uh, Pennsylvania too is is their voting um, uh, uh, requirement too. too their, their their voting laws is is it's not a uh, a, a property owning um, a requirement for uh, to be a, a voter in in Pennsylvania, um, and so the um, uh, it's actually taxpayers that are over yes. twenty one years old. They're they're that are residents of of Pennsylvania. They're the ones that are they're able to vote. There's no racial requirement uh, in Pennsylvania. It's it's a taxpayer requirement rather than a property requirement. Other other um, uh, colonies turned states had had certain levels of property that that a uh, persp uh, potential voter had to to meet in order to be eligible uh, to 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 vote um, in, in their in that respective state. Um, and the um, um, the other thing that was that's interesting about the um, uh, Pennsylvania Constitution is that it did have a religious test for serving in uh, the the unicameral legislature, the Pennsylvania Assembly, um, and the uh, that religious test re required uh, a, a candidate to before they they take their seat in the assembly is to um, um, uh, uh, actually swear that they believed in both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, so that pre uh, prevented uh, Jewish Americans from, from uh, serving in the, um, the assembly that, um, um, and so we ha have here on, on screen that religious test that, that the um, people had to, uh, uh, before they served in the assembly, had to swear to. Um, and so, Interesting thing there. This religious religious test, if you know your United States Constitution, uh, are, are 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 kind of abolished with the the federal Constitution, and so. Uh, but certain states did have these kinds of things um, in the Revolutionary period. Um, let's move on to Massachusetts, Jim. Uh, sure. One of your near and dear to your uh, current research oh, yes. and writing. So. The Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, um, amazingly, uh, is still the constitution that Massachusetts uses today, uh, although it has gone through many uh, amendments. Uh, it's still the, the, the general framework of, of, of Massachusetts's uh, uh, government today, which is pretty amazing. It's, uh, it's the longest, uh, the oldest uh, state constitution uh, still in, a, in effect. So, uh, Jim, tell us uh, about the uh, kind of long-standing effort to get a constitution for Massachusetts, which involved a new thing called a convention. Yeah, and you're exactly right. As my advisor once said, it's the longest, I think he said this at least, he said it's the longest running constitutional roadshow in American history or something. Um, uh, and I mean, 
like you said, it has undergone lots of amendments, but the fact is uh, they're all amendments to this document. And, and um, rightly so, it's um, extraordinary in a number of ways. It took Massachusetts, unlike Pennsylvania, it took Massachusetts a while to write a new constitution for a bunch of complicated reasons that would be very boring if I were to explain all of them. But you're exactly right it, that the document they, they finally did produce was grounded in a kind of deeper legitimacy or at least potential, potentially deeper legitimacy because of the process by which uh, it was written. So when you, like we were talking about, so you need to write a constitution, cool. How do you do that? I mean, people don't have any experience doing this. And initially, especially in places that didn't have a kind of functioning framework of government, like if, you know, after independence, uh, there's no more royal governors, uh, royal government gone. So it's kind of just a vacuum. Uh, you need something in place very quickly. Uh, and so by necessity uh, and inclination, but by necessity, Americans end up writing lots of documents quickly and um, just kind of uh, saying that, okay, this is the constitution now. Um, that was better than nothing, but it wasn't ideal because again, think of the principles that uh, you're familiar with uh, related to the American revolution, you know, uh, the whole thing about consent, um, about the, think of the American Revolution, the right to alter or abolish your government. It's this notion that the people have a say in this. And uh, even if it's the representatives of the people writing these constitutions, uh, still the fact that they just sort of say they're in effect without any chance for anybody to like, you know, say, yeah, this looks good or no, this doesn't look good. That can be problematic. So what happens in Massachusetts is a couple of different things. First of all, they, they say, okay, we need a new constitution. Okay, we'll have, uh, we'll elect people. They're going to be in the legis normal legislature, but also they're going to write a constitution. And as a, uh, in addition to that, they're going to send that draft out to all the towns in Massachusetts to hundred by 1780s, over 300 of these little towns of varying sizes. Uh, and uh, everybody's gonna get together. They're gonna look at the constitution and they're gonna say what they like and what they don't like, and they're gonna vote on it. And if they vote uh, that they like it, then it'll be put in place. Now the advantage of that, and this is what we call ratification, of course, um, keep that in mind, um, because that'll come back and uh, be, become a hallmark of American constitutionalism. Uh, the advantage of that is, is that you will, in some plausible, if slightly imperfect way, it's never going to be perfect, you're going to get a real sense that, that people actually have consented to the form of government that they're living under, right? Uh, the problem is, in <laughs> fact, that, that's actually, there's a lot of sort of uh, questions you have to work out about how that process actually works. Massachusetts writes the constitution in 1778. They send it out to the towns and um, towns, a majority of towns find some reason that why they don't like it. And so they vote no. Um, so first try uh, uh, down the tubes. So they have to get together and write a new constitution. Well, by this point, they, um, they decide that, you know, this process of just the members of the legislature sort of taking time out of their day to debate the constitution and write it, maybe that's not the best for a practical reason. One, they're dealing with a lot of stuff, especially related to the war, a lot of stuff going on. It's hard to compartmentalize. I can't uh, multitask and neither could they really well. So maybe it'd be better for that reason alone to have maybe a separate set of people get together and write a constitution. But also there's a deeper sort of theoretical foundation to this is if you have a sitting government writing a constitution, um, you know, maybe because they're in charge of implementing it, uh, maybe it's not actually that good to have them writing the fundamental law because they're gonna be the ones bound by it. So. There's kind of a conflict of interest there. But if you have what you call a convention, 
that you're going to get a group of people together, you're going to elect them, they're going to come together for the sole task of writing a constitution, and then they adjourn and go their separate ways. They have no power, they have no um, you know, uh, uh, existence past the writing of the constitution. That has the potential to endow this document with even greater legitimacy. And that's what ultimately happens in Massachusetts. They write a, uh, the convention rights constitution, they send it out. Very complicated uh, process of ratification. Uh, all these towns have tons of opinions on all sorts of things uh, and, and write them down in a very complex way. <laughs> they send them all back. The convention looks at them in sort of horror that, because they have no idea how to sort through all of this. Uh, by and large, they conclude that a majority of people in Massachusetts approved a majority of things in the constitution. And that's, I think, probably right. A few things uh, they probably didn't approve, but they just declared that, uh, that the constitution had been ratified. And so imperfections notwithstanding, this served, this suggested a kind of model that on theoretical grounds, um, Americans, not just in Massachusetts, but throughout the United States, recognized as having a lot of potential. Again, the goal is to create governments that were legitimate, that people would uh, comply with, that they would see as uh, truly something that they had created. And this new process suggested that uh, they could take that kind of theoretical notion that sovereignty lies in the people and channel it in some kind of tangible way into a, an actual document. So that's, I think, one of the cool things that happened in Massachusetts. Right, and, and I'd like to point out at the bottom of the image you see uh, a declaration of rights. And, and, and a yeah. number of the state constitutions had their own declarations of the rights of, uh, of the people. Pennsylvania had a, a, a similar declaration. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, text there, but I, I included it here. Um, the first right, all men are born free and equal. You know, so quote, kind of quoting the uh, Declaration of Independence and er, the uh, earlier Virginia Declaration of, of Rights. And, and um, uh, people are, are, are paying attention to this. And um, there's even cases of enslaved uh, uh, men and women suing for their freedom yep. uh, in Massachusetts because of this, the famous case of Elizabeth Freeman, also known as Mum Bet, um, successfully uh, won her freedom in, in court. Uh, due in large part because of this Declaration of Rights as part of the Massachusetts uh, Constitution. And of course, these Declarations of Rights lay the, the groundwork, the framework uh, for the later Bill of what we, what we called, eventually called the Bill of Rights as part mm -hmm. of the uh, federal Constitution. Um, and as Massachusetts is wrangling with how to create a new government, other states are sort of rapidly creating governments. There's also this thing called the, as you probably well heard of, the Articles of Confederation, which is bringing together these states to conduct the Revolutionary War as, as part of a loose confederation, uh, joining this effort together um, to uh, do things like wage the war, engage in diplomacy as, as a, a nation. But it, it certainly had its limitations through with, with no power to, to uh, enforce taxes, uh, get um, funds from the, uh, draw out funds from the states to conduct this, this war. So the states were um, uh, still operating as independent, uh, very independent uh, states coming together for, for one cause, but the Articles of Confederation was, had, had plenty of issues. And the uh, Constitutional Convention that comes about in 1787 is coming about to revise these Articles of, of Confederation, not to toss them out initially, but that ends up what's, that ends up what's happening. So um, in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, just two blocks away from where I'm sitting right now, uh, delegates uh, come together to, uh, uh, work on on uh, amending the and improving the Articles of Confederation, but they end up coming with coming up with a brand new document that becomes the United States Constitution. And one of the uh, the the amazing documents that is on display here in Philadelphia on loan from the Dorothy Tapper Goldman Foundation is what's known as the uh, the Dunlap Claypool printing of the Constitution, printed on September seventeenth, seventeen eighty seven. That's the day the Constitutional Convention ends. Uh, here in Philadelphia, that night, it's the the uh, d document itself is uh, is printed and distributed uh, 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 to the states 
for uh, ratification consideration uh, at, the, at the state level. Um, this is uh, a really amazing uh, uh, survivor, rare survivor. It's one of uh, about 15 or so that survive uh, from, from 1787. This is the only one that still remains in, in private hands. All the rest are in institutional collections. So pretty amazing. It's a rare opportunity to, to see uh, a Dunlap Claypool printing from uh, the, the very first official printing of the, of the Constitution on display. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uh, connections between uh, the, uh, what the Constitutional Convention uh, decides upon and, and presents to the states between the, uh, the very many connections between the revolutionary state constitutions like uh, that of Massachusetts and Pennsylvania that we just talked about. So what are some of the, the lessons that the convention, Constitutional Convention learned from the, the state processes of, of creating constitutions? Uh, Jim, can you, can you share some, some interesting stories of, uh, about that? Yeah, well, a huge uh, topic, of course, that, uh, you know, we won't be able to cover everything, but, right. um, you know, it, it is, you know, that connection between what Americans are doing on the state level, beginning in 1776, running all through the 1780s, and, and to 1787 and, and immediately after, is, I think, um, just one of the most fascinating questions in American history, because as we've seen, I mean, Americans are you know uh, getting a lot of experience writing constitutions, but you know they're they're writing constitutions for their states, which is difficult enough. I mean, there's so many things you have to decide on. It can be, as we see in Massachusetts, you know, uh, people have all kinds of different ideas that you have to sort out. So that's not easy. But the advantage is that you're writing, uh, you know, a plan of government for you know, uh, basically that's designed to do something you're familiar with, right? These states had been colonies before, they had had governments, the same people who are writing the new state constitutions have a familiarity with how those governments worked. You know, they knew the kinds of things that those governments needed to do. And so, you know, they had some blueprints in mind, you know, that they could kind of build on and kind of tinker with, uh, to, to accord with new circumstances. When it came to what all of those states are going to collectively comprise, that's the real trick because that was unprecedented. The states had, of course, all been part of the British Empire, but they had not had any formal connection to one another before. They'd been sort of next to each other but, um, you know, if you were in Massachusetts, ultimately, you know, you had no say in what happened in Connecticut. And in most cases, it probably didn't uh, matter uh, much what Connecticut was doing. This is very different because, hey, in, in starting in 1775, you're fighting a war against Great Britain. Uh, it's really tough to beat Great Britain. They're really powerful. And so you have to co cooperate in that endeavor, you, as we saw, you form a kind of, um, well, the United States Declaration is declaring something called the United States. Much later, Thomas Jefferson will say, the Declaration is the fundamental act of union of the states, this idea that something is being created. What exactly that is, is sort of a, a, an ongoing question. And the Articles of Confederation, which we showed, um, this is, uh, an attempt to figure out how this was going to work. Uh, it really resembled more uh, something more akin to a kind of international alliance in some ways, but um, very tricky because the Continental Congress or Confederation Congress that was created this sort of um, you know uh, national body uh, had lots of powers to do stuff to. Uh, you know, uh, borrow money and uh, uh, form treaties and all these things. But ultimately, as you said, Matt, it left it up to the states to implement all of those policies sort of voluntarily. So a, very, a, a, very, a system that works very differently from any state constitution. And so the question that Americans are facing in 1787 as they're gathering, the delegates are gathering in Philadelphia is, okay, um, how do we actually form something that both respects the states? Americans like their states. They don't want to get rid of them. But 
accomplishes all of these other goals that even in the, the Articles of Confederation, we had agreed collectively we need to handle together. And so I think the, the strategy that they end up adopting, and they probably don't, not many people go, or if any people go to Philadelphia with this in mind, but I think it, it kind of, the, the solutions kind of lay themselves out as they start debating this is, well, look, how on any, in any political society, in any state, uh, do you get buy-in from all the people of that state, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, whatever? Well, you have representatives uh, that represent uh, various constituencies in the state. They get together. Uh, they're the one that, um, that passes laws, uh, just agrees on what to do, and those laws are seen as legitimate because, again, they're acts of, you know, the representatives of the people. And that model, you know, you need to represent all the people of these states uh, in a, 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 a sort of more nuanced way than the articles had. The key thing about the articles, every state gets one vote, no matter how big it is, no matter how many people it has, every state gets one vote, which is important because people like their states. Um, but if you're trying to apportion, say, taxation, not as compelling, because if you live in a, a big state, why should, you know, if you live in New York, why am I going to let Delaware tell me what, uh, the, I mean, there's not many people in Delaware, great state, but, you know, um, you need some kind of system of representation that is going to allow you to say, okay, we have actually consented to all of these things and we'll do them. Ultimately, that's what they end up doing in the great question that really faced the, the convention is, is how do you uh, represent all of these states? And the solution, as everybody knows here, I'm sure is in one house, they have representation proportional to population. Another house, the Senate, uh, each state gets two votes. And so that kind of sets, that, that allows the convention to go forward and decide on other questions. But really the, the United States Constitution in key ways, well, again, acknowledging and respecting the integrity of the states is going to, in, at least in some ways, function more like a political society that Americans are familiar with on the state level. The sort of principles of consent uh, that they espouse throughout the revolution are gonna be applied on a different level. And I think that's what allows Americans to come to terms with this very novel and sometimes sort of scary, um, you know, new federal government. What is this going to mean for the future? Uh, but I think that's how they ultimately begin to do it. And there's concerns uh, uh, about um, uh, about strength of the of the states. Uh, there's concerns about strength of this new federal government. Uh, but ultimately, what what happens is the the federal constitution it it still leaves a lot. Up to the up to the states in 1787, and uh, we're going to see some of those uh, issues play out in the in the 19th century about voting rights, about slavery, um, uh, about uh, popular sovereignty. It's it's uh, there's a lot still left up to the to the states in the 1787 Constitution, and I just want to point out a block and a half away, we're done. We're up right now. We're we're done. Glapp and Claypool printed that that Constitution that we have on display right here in the heart of Old City, Philadelphia. And so as the United States moves into the early 19th century, uh, and, and at the, of course, at the end of the 18th century, states are being added to the Union. There's, there's provisions in the Constitution that allow for the admission of, of, of new states um, and that they have to create Republican forms of, uh, of government. Uh, and they had to be approved by, by Congress. Um, and so we're seeing states like Ohio and Illinois, Alabama, Louisiana, all, all joining uh, this union. Um, of course, with westward expansion, um, this, this land is being um, uh, 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 taken from, from Native Americans. Uh, and many Native Americans are, are resettled by the United States government in um, reserved territories and places like what is now Oklahoma. Uh, uh, one of the nations uh, that is removed is the uh, Choctaw Nation, which was uh, largely based in, um, in uh, what is now Mississippi. Uh, and um, one of the interesting things that the, the Choctaw Nation does is that uh, after they, they are uh, forced, forced to uh, be removed from their 
their original homeland and move to what is now Oklahoma, they actually write their own uh, Republican form of government and, and write it down in a constitution uh, that's uh, very similar to uh, the federal constitutions. And Jim, just a quick word about this uh, constitution and, and some interesting things about it. Yeah, really fascinating because we have to remember Native Americans are adopting various strategies um, to um, respond to all of the things that are happening and, and that you just described, Matt, is what is the best strategy for preserving autonomy, freedom in the face of uh, what is often, I mean, almost always a very aggressive um, either federal government or Americans acting through their state governments. Uh, so Georgia, for instance, uh, uh, key player in the removal of the Cherokee Nation um, a little earlier uh, than this. And so as they're looking at different strategies, one strategy that they, um, they look to is trying to show that um, you know, they can combine both their uh, traditional forms of government with these kind of new American forms of government. And in this way, sort of convince uh, American authorities to allow them to retain a good de uh, a degree of, of autonomy. And so uh, constitutions like that written by the Choctaw is very interesting for the ways in which it, it sort of incorporates uh, aspects of traditional Choctaw governance with the form of I mean, what we've been talking about, this American constitutional form. So a fascinating and, and huge topic that uh, you know, I wish we had more time to, to get into, but um, urge anybody of, to look more into it. Speaking of, of huge is in the next volume that we're, we're gonna talk about. One of the, the yeah. largest you know, documents is actually a book uh, or a bound vo volume is uh, connected to Louisiana and its, and its constitutional uh, convention. So states like Louisiana, Alabama, others are, are looking to precedents set by Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and of course the, the constitutional convention of 1787 for what to do uh, about their own uh, governments and, and, and changes to government over time. Because states, once they adopt a constitution, doesn't mean they have to st stick with it. There are amendment procedures uh, in, in the constitutions of the states. So places like Pennsylvania and uh, are, are even adapting, adopting new constitutions in the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, making key changes. Like in Pennsylvania, the uh, racial requirements were added to the, the voting law uh, in 1838, uh, taking the vote away from African-Americans African-American taxpayers in the state, a huge, huge issue in, in Pennsylvania, especially in Philadelphia. Uh, Louisiana is uh, uh, debating uh, a new constitution uh, in the 1840s. And unlike the very secretive 1787 constitutional convention, where we actually, as even historians know very uh, relatively little about what actually went on inside of uh, the Pennsylvania State House, what is now Independence Hall, uh, we know bits and pieces from notes that some of the delegates uh, were taking, but Louisiana actually printed and published all of the proceedings of the, the Constitutional Convention of, of 1845. This is a huge volume. It literally word for word, everything is in there. Uh, and I just wanted to come out, uh, Jim, I, I put some of these on screen, some of the interesting uh, statements. Maybe you could just talk about these two. Uh, because um, one of the debates was about where to put the capital and some of the, the issues regarding that. Right, you're, you're quite right, is the contrast between what we know of the federal constitution, we have, you know, the main thing we have is James Madison's notes, which he only published decades later, and they're sort of incomplete. We sort of wonder, you know, how complete are these? Have they been changed at all? Um, not necessarily the case on the state level. Uh, lots of states do this where uh, it's a free and open uh, sort of circus. Circus is a strong word. It's, a, it's an event that people are paying close attention to their constant reports of what's uh, going on in them. And indeed there's a kind of um, almost a, a back and forth while the conventions are going on about um, you know, what people back home are thinking. So obviously not something that happened much 
in Philadelphia in 1787. But uh, you're right, uh, Louisiana is one of these states. And so we have all of these things that they talk about. And uh, some of the things they talk about are just fascinating. And one of the things that all these new states, especially new states, although old states too that write new state constitutions because those old states are changing. Uh, the question is often debated in, in uh, constitutional conventions, where to put the state capital? And you think, you know, how big of a deal is this? A huge deal, especially in the 19th century, because remember it's the 19th century, um, you know, everything travels by foot. Eventually you'll have the telegraph, but still the geographical location of the capital is a huge deal um, practically uh, because um, it, will, it will affect so many things related to the development of that state. Most of these states, uh, these new states start off, you know, people aren't living in every part of the state. They're all, all often clustered in kind of one area. And so you're looking to the future and, and thinking, okay, well, how is this going to develop over time? Uh, we'll, how are we going to make sure that the kind of entire state gets developed in you know, reasonable fashion? Locating a state capital in a particular place, often maybe the center of the state, what a concept, um, that could help because that means, you know, presumably you want the state capital connected to other places by like roads and things. Uh, if you build a state capital in the middle of the state, that kind of means you're going to have to build roads. It's going to sort of flesh out how the state develops. And it's also going to allow citizens living in every part of the state, you know, relatively equal access to the halls of power. You know, if you put one, if a state capital on one end of the state, the people living on the far end you know, aren't going to get, be able to get there as easily. So, you know, they would have legitimate concerns about, you know, if their rights and views are being, uh, you know, respected. So in, in Louisiana, kind of an old state because originally a French colony, Spanish colony at one point, and a French colony, it, uh, fascinating history. But by the 1840s, they are debating a new constitution and this question of where to put the state government comes up, uh, the capital or the state capital, uh, where to put that. Uh, it's currently in New Orleans, by far the largest city in the state and even in the southern half of the United States. Um, it, it dwarfs uh, anything, um, any other city um, around. So it's a kind of a model of a, a metropolis to the extent that there is a metropolis in the area. And the concern voiced kind of self-servingly uh, by people not from New Orleans is that, uh, you know, if you put the capital in New Orleans, all the Officers of government are going to be in New Orleans, and um, we all know cities are kind of dens of, uh, you know, bribery and all kinds of other nasty things that are going to corrupt the government. Uh, and so, um, you yeah, know, bribe with gumbo be... and turkey. Yeah, apparently. exactly. <laughs> this is some a, a speech that somebody gives, and he's this guy's. I think defending uh, the, you know, having the uh, capital in uh, New Orleans and all these sorts of accusations going on about how awful New Orleans is. And he goes, you know, have, has anybody been actually bribed with a plate of gumbo here? Um, I just thought when I was looking for um, ways to kind of tease out these themes that we've been talking about, uh, I ran across this and um, it just seemed <laughs> sort of, so sort of, uh, you know, revealing of this particular place and time, but also in, me, in making a, a legitimate point that Americans, not just in Louisiana, but in every state to one extent or another, end up debating. It, 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 yeah, so Baton Rouge is decided upon as the as yeah. the capital, uh, and of course the Baton Rouge still remains capital Louisiana. Right. Um, the other, the next um, topic I want to bring up is the constitutional crisis surrounding uh, slavery that is really rising in the uh, the early uh, 19th century, but then uh, with the uh, uh, secession of Southern states. Uh, and the establishment of the Confederacy, it, it takes on a, a brand new uh, form, uh, this, this uh, debate over the future of, of slavery in the United States. Um, and the, what we have on display uh, from the Dorothy Tapper Goldman Foundation's collection is a copy of the Confeder Confederate uh, States Constitution, uh, which is this, uh, reaffirming and uh, uh, establishing that slavery is going to be protected 
uh, in, in the Confederate, Confederate States. It's uh, a direct response to uh, compromises that have been made about um, restricting the spread of slavery and, and the territory that was part of the Louisiana Purchase, for example, earlier in the, in the 19th century. Um, Jim, briefly, you want to talk about you know, how this um, constitution is similar and, and different uh, to the federal constitution of the United States? Absolutely. And I'm uh, so glad we're able to touch on this, you know, again, so briefly, there's so many things that, you know, uh, I wish we could go into much greater depth. So certainly, slavery uh, and race is one of the absolutely central topics um, in American history, uh, and appropriately enough in this uh, exhibit as well, to the you know, uh, extent that, um, uh, you know, we can uh, explore all of the complexities here. Um, I think that the thing to mention is that uh, obviously slavery, a huge topic of debate uh, always uh, in American constitutional, constitutionalism, uh, going back of course to the federal constitution of 1787. And the key thing to note here too, is that uh, in large degree, the status of slavery in a particular state was left up to the state to decide and so uh, Americans, and this, we get at this theme that this is Americans uh, deciding um, the, the future of their political societies in, in all their different forms. Uh, the prohibition or uh, allowing slavery in their state was uh, one of those things that Americans debated. Uh, and so uh, Americans are always um, uh, you know, debating this question it becomes really the, the central question of the 19th century um, for, uh, for Americans and leads to a crisis ultimately when the question becomes uh, whether um, the preponderance of uh, the federal government's power is going to be represented, whether free states or slave states are going to have an advantage in ultimately Congress. This is seen as uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, an issue that's going to affect the future of slavery where it already exists. In the lead up to the Civil War, the question, the main question being debated was the extension of slavery into the federal territories. Well, by 1860, there's a, a political party, the Republican Party, uh, which is devoted to restricting the spread of slavery. Uh, Lincoln, uh, the leader of the Republican Party, the first Republican president, um, believes that in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, uh, the Congress can limit the spread of slavery. Uh, he thinks this is perfectly legitimate and constitutional. Uh, Americans from slave states see Lincoln's election as uh, a precursor to what they believe is inevitable um, attack on slavery, even in states where it already exists. Um, that leads to secession, uh, in which uh, Confederates point to the threat, at least their perceived threat, to the institution of slavery as the overriding reason to secede from the Union and to form a new, um, a new uh, a country, which they're going to call the Confederate, uh, Confederate States of America. And that name, Confederate States, you might think, well, they're going to come up with um, something that looks like maybe the Articles of Confederation. Confederacy, Confederation, right? Uh, not really, no, not at all. Uh, they, they take the United States Constitution because they're not stupid. Uh, the Articles of Confederation did not work. And especially for Confederates looking ahead and realizing that they're going to have to fight a war to secure their independence, something like the Articles of Confederation isn't gonna do the trick anyway. Um, that's not going to, uh, we saw how that went during the revolution. So they take the United States Constitution in, you know, uh, in basically its form and make a few changes to it. Uh, they make, for instance, uh, and the, the president is not going to be eligible for re-election. He's going to serve one six-year term. Uh, they make a couple other minor changes, but the key one and, and the revealing one is unlike the US Constitution, which never uses explicitly the word slave or slavery, 
uh, in, many, in several places, uh, the Confederate Constitution guarantees uh, the right to own slaves, to take slaves in new territories, all of the questions that Americans had debated over the course of the 19th century that led up to this crisis. Uh, Confederates, when they get the chance to write this new constitution, they're going to insert in the foundational document, uh, sort of putting it uh, beyond debate. These things aren't gonna be debated anymore. And indeed, when the first and only uh, man ever elected vice president of the Confederacy, ironically named Alexander Hamilton Stevens, uh, gets up in March of 1861 to give a speech about the Confederate Constitution, he frames it as uh, something that is an advance even on the work of the founding generation of the drafters of the US Constitution because he says the cornerstone of the Confederacy is the notion of white supremacy. And he says that explicitly. Uh, and he's talking about the Confederate Constitution, that this is the document that's going to allow us to um, you know, uh, enshrine that, what he says, fundamental and moral truth. So um, incredibly important thing to for us to reckon with. And I'm glad we're able to uh, display this document because it's, it's part of this very complicated story of American democracy that we're, we're telling. All right, thanks, Jim. And I wanted to point out this flag that you can probably see behind me uh, that we have on display on loan from Jeff Bridgman, uh, no union with slavery, uh, 13 uh, alternating black and white stripes with an eagle in the canton or upper left corner, uh, 23 stars on this flag. It's from 1861, there were 34 states in the United States before uh, secession. So minus the uh, states that seceded, this is a, an exclusionary flag. Uh, so removing the stars of the states that has seceded. Abraham Lincoln was very much against this when, when, when he uh, became president. He, he wanted to emphasize that the union was still together, removing stars from the flag would serve to sort of legitimize the Confederacy. He wanted to make sure that the, the union held together. So really amazing flag uh, that we have on, on display here connected to that story of the Confederate uh, Constitution and the crisis over uh, slavery in the 19th century. Um, the last few things I wanna bring up here are, are as the uh, United States is expanding even farther west, there's some interesting things going on in places like Wyoming like uh, and Utah and uh, the, um, there, the franchise ex is expanded in Utah, in uh, Wyoming, for example, uh, uh, to include um, women. Uh, this is uh, partly uh, progressive, also partly uh, uh, practical. There were, uh, uh, Jim, uh, I know you write about this in, in the book uh, that accompanied the exhibit, but there are actually very few women in Wyoming at the time. They're seeking to uh, boost the population there as, as more and more people are moving to Wyoming. Um, anything you want to mention, mention here with that? Yeah, really fascinating. I mean, uh, one of the key questions and, uh, you know, uh, one of the many things that uh, it'd be great to talk more about. I know you guys are uh, going to have an, uh, an exhibit that just explores more of this question um, of women voting and the history of women voting. The, the fact is, um, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that would have precluded a state from allowing women to vote. Um, <laughs> there's nothing in there. It, it's up to the states to decide. And so uh, you think, well, maybe some state will uh, explore this, uh, but it takes until 1889, with the exception of New Jersey, of course, for a very brief mm -hmm. uh, set of years in the 1790s and early 19th century. Uh, but that's the exception until uh, Wyoming uh, in 1889. They, uh, uh, women had been able to vote uh, in Wyoming territory before this, a very interesting story. Not a lot of people, not a lot of white settlers living in Wyoming uh, at this time, we should note. Uh, but when it came time for Wyoming to write a constitution in 1889, uh, they decided after they had a very brief debate uh, revealing, uh, but mainly revealing in the fact that um, the convention just uh, uh, continues the policy of allowing women to vote in 1889. And so that's the first state uh, whose constitution explicitly guarantees the right of women to vote. And you think, well, uh, the, the dam is going to break. Other states are going to allow women to vote soon after this. A few do, 
but it's going to take another generation or so before the idea uh, that women should vote in general throughout the United States uh, ultimately uh, is, is guaranteed through the 19th Amendment. But you know, here we see kind of re the relationship between what's going on on the state level. Americans can um, push for different um, uh, 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 provisions that may not be generally accepted yet, but they can try them out, uh, convince other Americans, look, look at Wyoming. Uh, the sky hasn't fallen in Wyoming when they let women vote. Um, this is just a, an extension of the sort of principles that uh, we fought for in the revolution that we pride ourselves on. And so um, that's, that's a kind of interesting connection between the state and the federal thing that, uh, you know, uh, levels that we've been talking about. Right. Each state's a little different. So I wanted to point out the bilingual New Mexico Constitution of 1910, both Spanish and English, uh, because it's reflective of the of the population that was living in New Mexico at the time and, and, and still is. So um, it, it, there's a lot of, of 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 difference at the state level. Um, federal amendments are, are sort of leveling the, the, the playing field in, in, in many ways in terms of codifying who can vote, who can be a citizen, especially with the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the, the 19th Amendment. Um, these are, are increasing the, the sameness at the state level um, uh, by, by, by making change at the federal level. So um, uh, mm -hmm. interesting story of how that um, historic progression happens. And so um, okay, we're, we're winding down here and I wanted to open up some time for, uh, for questions. Um, so uh, I wanted to bring up, we'll take a look at the, uh, at the chat. I know, uh, I believe that there's been some questions asked. We'll, we'll take a look at some. And, um, and so let's see, I'm gonna take a look at, uh, and Jim, I think you can see these as well. So uh, yeah, great. So uh, let's go. Okay, let's see. It was, uh, so the questions about the um, Claypool family of uh, related. Yeah, that, that interesting uh, note that we just got a, uh, a donation from uh, uh, descendants of Betsy Ross uh, connected to the, uh, that had the uh, uh, Revolutionary War diary of, of uh, John Claypool, who, is, who eventually became Betsy Ross's uh, third husband. Uh, so referencing a story there, um, I'm going to, so what's the best book on the Constitutional Convention of 1787? Any recommendations, Jim? Oh, what, what, yeah, well. Recommended reading. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many, I mean, there's, there's, there's a time there. Uh, there's a book by Richard Beeman uh, called Plain Honest Men, which gives a good, good overview. Um, but there, it's such a vast literature, um, but that, that could be a good uh, starting place. It gives a good narrative of, of what happened and, and the, debates. There's another question about um, uh, Native American constitutions and uh, what other nations uh, wrote constitutions. And maybe you want to talk about the Cherokee constitution a little bit, just to bring it, bring it up. Yeah, many, many do. Uh, many did. And, and many do uh, have constitutions today. Um, so uh, the, the uh, Cherokee constitution is uh, an especially notable one. It was written in the 1820s. And uh, again, it was part of this attempt by the Cherokees to um, secure their place uh, uh, in, in this new um, transformed continent. Uh, and uh, the Cherokees and, and other nations um, did very interesting things in order to try to, uh, again, these are all different strategies and so different uh, Native American groups in different places and different circumstances end up adopting, you know, different strategies to pursue here. But one strategy adopted by the Cherokees is to write a constitution. I mean, uh, Cherokees had also created a written language. Um, Cherokees, uh, like the Choctaws, uh, uh, allowed slavery, uh, actually, and uh, they pointed to this as uh, another sign of their uh, ability to kind of um, exist, coexist in this um, American society, you know, alongside this American society, you know, uh, uh, owning in, in this, you know, again, um, specific 19th century context, they could argue that uh, 
doing things like owning slave, slaves, uh, African-American slaves was a sign of their, uh, you know, the fact that they were just like other Americans and adopting a constitution, as we mentioned, um, was another way to do that. Uh, but in different circumstances, that act of writing a constitution could be seen uh, by white Americans as a kind of threat that, uh, and, and this is generally how uh, this was received by the, uh, you know, uh, uh, when the Cherokees wrote a constitution uh, that it, it seemed to sort of even in, in a greater degree mobilize Americans to figure out how to remove uh, the Cherokees from uh, the lands they currently possessed somewhere else. So uh, again, an enormously complex story. I wish I were more of an expert on this uh, to give you guys a full explanation, but there's a, a wide range of scholarship available on this. Great. Thanks. And, and, and Thanks, the key, Jim. I mean, I, again, a, a, a big uh, point I would make is that uh, we've been talking about uh, Americans taking a big role in drafting their own constitutions. And in, uh, a, a point that maybe hasn't been emphasized enough is obviously at many points, large numbers of Americans have not been granted the opportunity to participate in this formal way in writing constitutions. But that should not lead us to think that all of these groups, again, uh, uh, sometimes or another, who have been denied this opportunity have not exerted a profound impact on American democracy at all times. Uh, they absolutely did. Uh, and we need to pay attention to that. So Native Americans, African Americans, uh, many other groups um, uh, uh, fall into that, that category. So that I want to emphasize that. And, and Jim, another question we had was about um, whether one particular state constitution served as the primary model for the federal constitution. Was it, was it Massachusetts that was sort of the, 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 the key model or? or? Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, it was more of a model than say the Pennsylvania constitution, uh, mm -hmm. just because uh, the one, the, uh, John Adams, ever heard of him, uh, drafted uh, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania, the, um, he didn't like the Pennsylvania Constitution. He drafted the Massachusetts Constitution. The convention changed a bunch of things that John Adams didn't like. But he, one thing that, many things John Adams did, but one important thing was um, he really uh, uh, kind of organized the Massachusetts Constitution in a lot of ways. So structurally, a lot of things did end up resembling the federal Constitution. But just uh, looking at the Constitution, um, you know, it's organized in nice sections with different, you know, breaks and things. Uh, earlier constitutions, a lot of them were just kind of like lists of provisions and they weren't sort of grouped in any specially well-organized way. Uh, and so in that regard, um, I think we can thank uh, John Adams for, for playing a key role there because uh, the federal constitution, you know, uh, easy to read. I mean, <laughs> you know, you could find what you're, what um, you're looking for pretty easily. Right. Well, thanks, Jim. I, I, I know we're, we're at 7.15 now. I wish we could, could talk longer. I'm sure a lot, a lot more questions are, are on the board here, but uh, um, I want to thank you for, uh, uh, tuning, uh, for all of you for tuning in and thank Jim for uh, coming out to us live from Arizona uh, to talk about the uh, exhibition. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, more uh, 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 great things coming up at the museum, including our special, special exhibit that'll open in the fall, Liberty, Don Troiani's Paintings of the Revolutionary War. Uh, uh, members of the uh, Museum of the American Revolution can join me for a sneak preview of the exhibit and the objects that will be in there from Don Troiani's collection uh, on, the, um, on August uh, 17th, uh, an evening program. And uh, I wanna thank you again for, for tuning in and I hope you can come back and see flags and founding documents on view until Labor Day. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody.